Welcome back to the Developer Tribe, everyone. I appreciate you taking the time to listen. This podcast delves into the processes and practices of coaches, educators, and beyond, offering their insight and giving us cause to reflect. Thank you for being here, however you got here. And with that, let's jump in. My guest today is Jason McCoy, a former footballer and a UEFA licensed coach. Jason specializes in sport for development after working for Street League and through his apparel company has run fundraising marathons, futsal programs and residential programs for disadvantaged young men. He contributed to writing the first coaching manual for Tackle Africa and traveled to Ghana to support its implementation. Amongst all of this, Jason maintains that being father to twin girls might be the biggest challenge of the lot. Jason, thank you so much for being here today. Hi, Tim. You right? Yeah, good to have you here. Uh, tell us about uh, Tackle Africa and your work with them. Okay, so that kind of came about when I was actually working at Street League. Uh, and Charlie Gamble, uh, who was one of Tackle Africa's founders, came to work at Street League as well. And um, Tackle Africa was something that he did on sort of like the side, if you like, uh, along with another guy that was working with at Street League called Gavin Atkins, who was a bit of a trustee. Uh, and so I got involved uh, and they basically explained that um, Tackle Africa used football to educate uh, young people across the continent of Africa about HIV, AIDS, safe sex and the treatment of the virus. Um, the thing that I, I liked about it is that at the time they trained coaches from the UK and, and then um, fundraised with their football marathon, which they held every year and used the, the, the money raised from the, the fundraising to send the coaches out to Africa to, 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 to do this, this, this training uh, with coaches out there, with teachers, educators out there, but also directly to, to the young people. Um, and at the time, I, you know, I was doing my coaching badges and they was pulling together uh, like a coaching manual and looking to do a coaching day here in London, you know, to get the guys up to speed that they was going to send out. And that's how I eventually got involved with, with helping them to, to write that manual. Uh, and the manual, um, to elaborate, is, is like is like a coaching manual. It's it's very cleverly done. It's it's a manual that can be used as a as a pure football coaching tool because the the drills in there have have key factors that relate to you know your development and your inv- involvement in the game. But what I liked about what they did and what they've cleverly done, and a lot of sport for development projects, uh, are kind of do something similar. Is the, the actual activity itself became a metaphor. Uh, for various aspects of understanding the virus or safe sex or or, or the, the, the sessions encouraged a, a sort of like behaviour that could lead to a discussion that could be expanded into uh, areas around safe sex and partners and multiple partners and these sorts of things. And so it was, it was good to, to be able to contribute to that. Uh, but what was even better um, was being able to go to Ghana it happened to be during the uh, 2008 African Cup of Nations, so we managed to kill two birds with one stone, uh, <laughs> and, and and we took in quite a lot of the games, um, which was an experience in itself. Um, but actually going out there and teaching the kids the sessions that you'd written down and seeing them sort of like take on board what you was trying to get across um, was great. Uh, the example I always give because it's, it's probably the best example and the one that people best understand will be uh, a shooting drill where we will teach the kids how to strike the ball, when to strike the ball, where to place a standing foot. And you'd set up a standard shooting drill. So you might have a goalkeeper, you might lay the balls off, kids run onto it and shoot and, and you coach from there. Um, but then the flip side of that is that the, the drill actually becomes a metaphor for the virus. So the goal becomes your body. The goalkeeper becomes your immune system and you might put three or four or five goalkeepers in and the balls now become opportunistic viruses so naturally with five goalkeepers and, and, and kids shooting who are not the best at shooting because you've not coached them for long enough yet um, there are not many goals flying into the net um, and you can explain that you know a strong immune system is like this goal being protected by these goalkeepers and then you can have the conversation around um, safe sex and the risk of uh, STIs and contracting HIV. And, and then you can explain what happens when you contract HIV to that immune system in that it becomes weaker. So you bring some of the goalkeepers out and with the improved shooting, some of the balls now start flying into the, the net or the opportunistic viruses start getting into the body. 
Um, as a result of that, you can explain about your CD4 count dropping below a certain level um, and your white blood cells being destroyed by the virus and uh, eventually you, you get you know, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, full-blown AIDS, where you have a very weak immune system and the body has very little protection against these opportunistic viruses now, which are now flying into the net, top corner, bottom corner, all over the place. And it's a kind of visual representation of how the virus works. And again, that can then lead to a wider discussion around uh, condoms and sticking with one partner or abstinence and so it was it was a really good experience and you mentioned the twins I actually came back from that trip on my actual birthday and uh, my wife at the time um, gave me um, a present which I thought was a watch and I opened it and it was a positive pregnancy test and it was twins so um, oh, amazing it was I was like you bought me a watch <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah right um yeah that was it that, that was a good time it was a good time in my life and it was a really uh, good experience and um they've now changed their approach um i'm doing a lot of plugging for tackle africa but it's a great charity uh they've now changed their approach in that they capacity build on the ground uh because um you know sport for development as a whole uh, sometimes goes into developing countries uh, like all singing all dancing and they run projects and then they leave and there's no legacy I think a lot of projects are addressing this now, uh, but like Tackle Africa seized on that quite quickly and, and now try to build capacity on the ground as opposed to sending UK and European coaches in uh, for a few weeks and then, then coming away and not leaving anything tangible there. So, so yeah, that, that, that was my involvement with them. I enjoyed it. And it sounds like an amazing project. We'll, we'll, we'll have to put some uh, links in, in the, the podcast yes. description so people can take a look and... Yeah. clearly this is so important to you this sport for development stuff and uh, you do some lo more local programs can you tell us a bit more about about those and maybe some of the challenges to implementing them yeah i mean um well, a little bit of backstory to, to to the curial sports as i said i worked at street league for, for nearly 10 years and was the uh, sports program manager for london and, and that was kind of my introduction into sport for development um, street league ran a really uh, still do, but back then, uh, a really uh, innovative program of football sessions based on hostels in different parts of London and other organisations that worked with disadvantaged groups. And we set up teams within all those organisations, so effectively anyone that accessed those services could join that team uh, and train every week and play once a month against all the other uh, projects, um, which was which was cool. And, and the, the coaches developed a bit of a rapport with them uh, and found out what it was that made them tick. And I think through the medium of sport, uh, because of the trust and, and the levels of respect involved, I find often that rapports are built more quickly between coach and participant, which then allow a platform for them to find out more about the participant. Often uh, we found out more about them than their key workers, what their interests were, what their fears were, whatever. And they were then able to, to put them through to the educational side of what Street League did. Um, and so I worked there for 10 years uh, and eventually left and, and set up uh, Mercurial Sports. And as you mentioned that in, in the introduction, it was initially providing team wear, sports apparel and equipment uh, for a partnership with a supplier hub in the Northwest. Um, but a business mentor suggested that I um, had all of this experience in sport for development. Um, it would be a shame to let it go to waste, so why don't you add that as an additional string to your bow? So I've tried to bring across what I've learned from the time of Street League into the curial sports. So now um, I, I kind of run like residentials um, and, and sports programs. There might be weekly programs, there might be workshops, um, as well as doing the, the, the apparel. And to answer the question, the, the, the challenge that I face is the challenge that all of sport for development faces and that is proving the link between sport and the development. Um, a lot of us work, work within the sector, we totally get it and we understand the benefits of sport, we understand the platform it creates upon which you can build quite a lot but sometimes people just see sport as sport and they don't see the connections like the sport as a metaphor that I explained before, they don't see how that works so I think the challenge for me, uh, as is for all uh, projects, is, is proving your outcomes are based on your input. Um, and that, other than funding, obviously, because nothing comes for free, your funding's always going to be a challenge. And 
with with me with mercurial sports being a limited company um it, it lim limits the pot of money that i can go through for uh quite a lot so i try and work in partnership with with bigger organizations and other organizations and local authorities which sort of brings me on to you know one of the main projects that that, that we've done and that's with like hackney local authority where we've run residentials for them uh, for different groups the first one was for young black boys in hackney trying to improve the outcomes for those uh guys so we ran a, a two three day residential uh, where we had um, some ex footballers come down and we had expert practitioners come down that you know that did workshops on various things that would help the boys improve their understanding of themselves and maybe broaden their opportunities um maybe get them to think about being something other than footballers which <laughs> I remember I quite bluntly said on the first day that none of them were going to be footballers <laughs> because I'm a realist. I mean, um, I wasn't killing people's dreams in case you're watching. Thinking, Who's this guy just, you know, just destroying people's hopes with aspirations. But, you know, the, <laughs> there is a reality in what I was saying. These boys were 16, 17 and, and most were playing once a week on Hackney Marshes. And I just explained to them that they were competing with boys that were playing four or five times a week in academies um, against elite players. A training with elite players, getting elite coaching, and you know, I said it, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, at the beginning, you probably was equal in terms of ability with some of those boys, but that input that they're getting will will will, will pull them way away from you. And so, by the time you're 17, 18, what they've got in the tank compared to what you've got in the tank means it would be very, very difficult for you to bridge that gap. Uh, and, and get professional contracts. So it, it was that sort of real conversation that you had to have with the guys uh, and then, you know, uh, trying to sort of like open up other avenues and other ways of thinking about what they could do going forward. So, um, and I kind of digressed a little bit, but, you know, going back to the challenges of, of, <laughs> of running a programme, running a project, it, it's very much, you know, proof of what you're saying you're going to do is going to have the outcome. Um, Sometimes it's hard to find the participants, believe it or not, because there's so many people offering similar things uh, um, to the same kind of target group. There's lots of money available to work with 16 to 24 year olds and lots of people are trying to get it. Uh, and then the work they do with the 16 to 24 year olds varies from project to project, organisation to organisation, some good, some bad. Um, there are a lot of smaller organisations that don't access that money because often they don't know about it or they don't know how to put together the right type of funding bid, whereas uh, people that know about the funding, maybe because they've been told about it, or they've got the experience, or they've got funder that fundraiser that's part of their team that can write the right bids and knows what to put in, they often get the money. So, um, yeah, lots of challenges around, you know, acquiring the right participants, uh, proving your, 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 what you're going to do is going to make a difference. And, and obviously the funding one is always going to be a major challenge as well. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, for unpacking all of that. Um, you, you started to touch on the the outcomes, and I totally understand that it's extremely difficult to to say what they are and to prove those. With that in mind, you know, what what are the intended outcomes of some of these programs that you put together? What, what are you trying to achieve? Well, I mean, if I could go back to to, to the project I did with Hackney, uh, the idea was, you know. Uh, to give them um, a better sense of perspective on themselves because often like um, young black boys in, in the European educational system are sort of lost, uh, their identity gets lost, uh, history is not about their history. Um, there's, there's lots to, to sort of like, that's not maybe as relatable to them as it would be if it was more about themselves. So uh, one of the outcomes was to improve their understanding of their identity and stereotypes and their place in society as it was. Uh, and, and that came out quite well um, because we did some surveys before and then surveys at the end of the weekend. And uh, one of the best pieces of feedback, which popped up a couple of times, was that they learned more about themselves and about the world in three days than they did in two terms at school, which, which was, you know, really really good feedback which kind of came from nowhere um, and so that was one of the main things the other thing was to get them as they were 16 year olds and going into their, their GCSEs um, some of them um, we did some stuff on NLP in sport but also how you can use it in terms of um, your, your education 
Um, we did do, we did workshops on um, job searching and all different types of things. So the outcome was just to give them a sort of like um, some alternative perspectives for them to look at themselves and to consider what their next steps would be and what it would take for them to to get to where they wanted to get to. Um, I guess ideally a program like that would have had a, a, a kind of longer term element to it where we could continue to work with them and see them realize uh, some of those those objectives uh, through the form of like mentoring whether informal or formal uh, signposting uh, and sort of hand holding them through their final years of school into their next steps whether they be college or whether it's uh, an apprenticeship or the world of work and I guess you know that that's probably the blueprint for a bigger longer project um, going forwards but generally the outcomes are to improve people's self-esteem or improve their understanding or raise awareness of of something that they might not be familiar with or options that they might not be familiar with um, so, yeah. so it, it sounds like a really intentional curriculum um, in which there are intended opportunities for uh, the, the young people to develop these these skills there's quite an argument around sort of social emotional learning programs sport for development programs as to whether these things are caught or, or taught do you have a, a real opinion on that? I think with the social and emotional learning side of things, and um, it's very much dependent upon one, the ethos of what you're trying to do, whether it's an afterthought or whether it's embedded into the whole uh, program from the beginning uh, of your, your inception of it to, to the actual delivery. Uh, I think if you have that, you're better equipped to um, brief the people that you engage, whether it's coaches um, or whether it's people that come in to do the workshops, uh, you better you better in a better place to brief them as to what the the long term or the objectives are, so they can tailor what they're doing and 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 modify how they go about their work in order to meet those objectives. Um, I think a lot of it is dependent upon the individual coaches because some of it is, is, is just caught, like because somebody's got the personality that, like whether they're a coach or not, they've just got that personality that they want to listen to people and they want to sort of understand what their issues are and they want to try and help. And if you're that way inclined and you're a coach, then if we, we're talking about football, then it's going to go beyond football because there are so many moments in and around the football sort of like, day or the involvement or training whether it's the beginning of it whether it's when there's a break in it or it's at the end of it where you know those kind of conversations that you can have with the participants are kind of priceless and if it comes sort of like organically um, and it's done well you can take away quite a lot of it but if it's structured in um, you know you might have your coach make sure he has a, a rotor of sitting down with each of the players at some point during the course of the session and just having a five ten minute chat because the dynamics of generally a coach and the sort of participants that get involved uh, when it's around sport for development is one where the coach is seen as the expert. You know, he's got his badges. He's generally half decent at football. So all of so all of those things contribute them to, contribute to being accepted and, and validated almost. And so if you can build a strong rapport on the back of that, then you, like I say, you're going to get out of a car. You're going to get out of the relationship far more than. Uh, uh, somebody sat at a desk with the participant opposite them and just having a conversation would get uh, be far. I found that to be the case on a couple of occasions, especially when I've worked in prisons, uh, when I've gone into prisons, which I have done with a project called Three Pillars. Uh, their sport was rugby, but the principles were the same. And you know, when they started to run the program with some of the inmates at the youth offending, youth offending institution, um, I was kind of given the, the, the caseworkers information about the inmates that the caseworkers simply didn't know um, and that was their job to know it and just because of the relationship that we had I was able to say you know he's interested in this he's interested in that his fears of this his fears of that so sports are a very powerful uh, platform for developing that sort of thing yeah I'm totally agreeing interesting thing <laughs> about your other your other programs in some some of these programs, especially sport for development, you see a lot of young coaches that are involved. It makes total sense that, you know, there may not be the opportunities to work in clubs. 
uh, if they're a, a level two or maybe even a B licensed coach, it can still be very difficult to find those jobs. So they do naturally gravitate towards these uh, more sort of sport for development type programs. And you touched on some of those qualities that might be necessary or at least would help those coaches be more successful in those programs in terms of listening, showing some humility, generating rapport. How, how do you think younger coaches or maybe slightly more inexperienced coaches can accelerate their development of those qualities? Um, it's a tricky one. Um, and I kind of have seen it firsthand, especially with the football and the community schemes who often have, like you say, the kind of younger demographic of coaches going out and doing their work. I remember the kicks program, that, um, uh, the Premier League clubs used to, I think probably still use, um, and some of the, the clubs, the coaches that they sent to deliver those those programs on the States were no, not much older than the participants. And in one sense, that can be a good thing because, you know, there's, there's, the, there's, there's the kind of like recognition that, oh, you're doing that, so can I. However, it's got to be the right type of coach. And, and this, this for me, uh, it, it, it's not a criticism of young coaches. It can be criticism of older, of older coaches as well. Um, the kind of language, the kind of kind of timekeeping, you know, where you're prepared, all of these things send signals. And too often I found coaches, especially younger coaches, they turn up, they might be late or they might be arriving at the same time as the participants are arriving. So they're setting up and the participants are waiting uh, around. Um, you know, there are issues that maybe they don't address around language and communication uh, between participants, it's missed opportunities. Um, you know, being prepared, having your players turn up when you're already there, your session set up, sends a message about preparation, um, which, you know, people can take away from that and coaches can draw attention to it. Um, I think uh, the, the hardest thing and one of the things I've seen time and time again is you have people working with disadvantaged groups that are sometimes challenging and sometimes not the easiest groups to work with. And issues will come up and rather than grasp the nettle and deal with the issue, which might be uncomfortable and it could be confrontational and it could be a bit awkward, they kind of shy away from it and let it go. And I think that they're doing young people a disservice when that happens. You've got to be prepared to, you know, if someone's constantly late, you've got to be prepared to sort of like pull them up about it and have the conversation about it. if you're late for this, you're probably late for everything else. And, you know, that's going to restrict your opportunities. It's going to change people's perception of you. You're going to get this perception of being unreliable and then things might not come your way. Or if you're in the habit of being late or being disorganized, when opportunities do come your way, you're more likely going to blow it because it's not in your MO to be on time and be prepared. So I think in terms of those coaches developing and accelerating their, their ability to, to be more than coaches, if you like, um, they really stems from looking at themselves and how they apply themselves. And then also then recognizing opportunities in and around sessions to address things when they come up, seeing opportunities to maybe have discussions and drawing out the opinions of people to have the debate because for me the, the hooks the sport and whilst you've got them there they're always going to be there because you enjoy the activity you're putting on but it's also an opportunity to do and look into and explore other things and it shouldn't be one that's wasted I, I, I believe yeah a, a brilliant answer and then uh, you know I was just thinking whilst you were speaking there around some of these uh, levels of, of badges that coaches take and it's very hard for coach educators to produce a, a genuine environment in which they might experience some of that confrontation or behavior problems so it's very difficult for coach eds to support coaches that might be moving into those spaces am i hearing you correctly that perhaps it's just through experiences that the, the younger coaches, the more inexperienced coaches can start to develop this understanding of noticing when to catch these moments and what to do in them. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I think unless it's prescribed to them, unless, you know, you're going to run a session and you're going to run it, you're going to run a program and you're going to run it with a, a particular group of young people um, that have certain challenges um, and you say to them, look, these guys are going to be neat. They're not, in, they're not doing anything. They're not going anywhere in their lives. So when you're coaching them, you're coaching the football because that's what they're there for. 
but make sure you engage with the stuff that they're doing that might be detrimental to their longer term goals and try and address those. Unless that's said at the outset, it will just fly over people's heads or you have somebody, a coach that has an understanding of, of the journey that these guys are going to be on and, and can use and see where they're going to go wrong and can try and address that in the session. Um, it's, 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 um, I think there's, there's definitely a place for coach education uh, um, alongside coaching education, if that makes sense. Um, because it's like some of the stuff that we talked about, especially at the elite level, um, you know, you're going to get coaches that, that their, their one goal is to produce professional footballers, um, not produce balanced um, people. Um, they're tasked with getting the next three or four pros through the door at a particular club. And in doing that, maybe they don't have time for the, or they don't feel like they have time for the development of, of, the, of people. Um, but that's what they're charged with. That's, that's whether they like it or not. And, so, and some embrace it. But that again goes back to them having that kind of personality uh, to be able to see that, that somebody needs certain help or needs advice or needs to something explained to them that will be, will be able to improve the way they look at things or their outcomes. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely something that should, could be done alongside uh, coach, coaching education and coach education because uh, they, they, they're, two, they're the same thing. Um, if you're developing players, you're developing people. Um, you can't really do one without the other, or you shouldn't. Yeah, yeah, you and I see very much eye to eye over all of that. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's um, you mentioned around the, the the elite environment and that sort of sense of almost a dual goal that that really those academies are trying to achieve. And through the the detail from the E Triple P and so on, what yeah. what kind of principles from the sport for development world would you see transferring, um, perhaps not easily, but transferring into the elite environment? Um, well, I, like I say, I think it's the, the, the development of the football side is all taken care of. Um, the development of, you know, to improve people's speed and agility and understanding of the game and everything else. That's, that's, that's you know, that's gone an overhaul, complete overhaul in the last 20 years. And, you know, football in, at elite level for developing young players is probably as high as it's ever been. I think what can come across in that world is this, this, this thing called banter. Um, that that is, is very, very kind of like much part of, of being in an academy setup or being in an elite football setup. And and the old schoolers will say, you know, this kind of stuff builds character. And I guess in a sense it does, maybe in a cruel way, but it does build character. It does build people into becoming the adults that they're set to become and so if you can build character using banter you can build other elements of a person's personality in other ways in the same environment and I think that you know the the, the, the banter building character approach needs to be allied with maybe some other stuff around having conversations around communications around their feelings um, you know, I know that guys, they do some work around plan Bs and what will happen if they're not professionals and things like that. And, you know, the, a lot of the educational side of things will, will come from that side of the club. But I just do think there's, there's something about, you know, dealing with your emotions and dealing with how you communicate with each other and, you know, understanding, you know, your place in the world and whatever issues, that, you know, relationships, money management, all of these things can become part of an environment that, 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 that is building a professional footballer, but also can become part of an environment that's building a better person because they're not all going to be footballers. You know, dealing with disappointment, uh, mental health, managing your emotions, all these sorts of things are all part of that kind of learning that can come across from sport for development and where it's done in different ways and done quite cleverly and introduced into an in elite environment. Um, not at the detriment of player development and not at the detriment of the football education, but just to supplement it. Because I would imagine a lot of boys come out of that uh, set up quite damaged. Um, one from the rejection, not making, making it as a professional footballer. But a lot of boys come out of that quite scarred by some of the things that have gone on uh, within that environment as well. And I guess there's sometimes there's not really anyone you can talk to 
um, and that can be a problem in itself. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's also a, a fair bit that's that's come out recently around a sense of athletic identity foreclosure, where these young young uh, people are basically seeing themselves as that athlete, as that footballer, and nothing else. You know, and, and they do have to live, eat, and breathe it. Um, yep. But at the same time, as you rightly say, needs to be developed into you know a more rounded person, especially given how how few make it into the professional world. Um, to touch on, you know, I, I I do hate the term banter myself, and and <laughs> but but I understand it. Maybe it's just because I'm no good at it. But but it, <laughs> the, the, the the necessary thing with it is that when you see coaches using that type of uh, language or that type of approach that is considered humorous or is intended to be humorous without a strong coach athlete relationship, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't, doesn't uh, have any uh, positive outcomes. If you can develop that rapport, that trust, that real strong coach athlete relationship, then that's where I see it having maybe some more utility where it's thrown in every now and then just to disrupt the, the learning, maybe to make the player a little bit more uncomfortable. I, I, I term it troublemaking, where you're just trying to create just a little bit of trouble for the players uh, so that it's something for them to, to have to solve. I, I, think the, I, think, I, think, I think the point you was making at the end there about the, uh, the banter and the coach-athlete relationship is quite important because um, I wrote... Um, blog I think it was or an article um, where I talked about how because of the dynamics of that coach footballer relationship the coach is the gatekeeper the footballer is eager to impress and sometimes if the banter is of a sensitive nature the player won't say anything unless he's incredibly strong character uh, because he doesn't want to disrupt that opportunity of getting through that gate he wants to play the next game he wants to you know, be recommended for the professional contract. So the banter can often be one sided and it's only afterwards when the player comes out of that and it's not worked out. It's like, well, actually, that banter was a bit abusive. I wasn't really comfortable with it. I couldn't really challenge it. I didn't know how to challenge it because I didn't want to, um, you know, I didn't want to um, disrupt the, the chances of becoming a professional footballer. Um, so it's 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 the, the banter thing's a dangerous thing, and again, it's on the coaches. There are numerous examples of coaches. The recent one, Peter Birds at Newcastle, where he termed what he was um, distributing dishing out to some of the younger footballers as banter. Uh, but then, when later down the line, the player said they felt like they were being racially abused, but they couldn't say that at the time because that would that, to them that might have meant the end of their time. At, Newcastle, he went to a tribunal, and I can't remember what they are. A lot of players came out and backed um, Peter Beardsley uh, and said that they didn't think he had a racist bone in his body, and maybe he doesn't. But maybe he doesn't understand the power of what he was saying or the way it was being received. And those young, younger players, um, maybe too afraid, this is a club legend, and they don't want to rock the boat, to, to just go with the flow. But behind closed doors, you don't know how that's impacting on them. It could be quite damaging and it could be quite degrading so um, I think that's important. There, there was a paper a couple of years ago that I'll, I'll put in as a, as a link that a couple of researchers went into elite clubs, elite football clubs and, and they really found around the social side they actually called it dubious social skills where <laughs> they, they talked about one in particular where well it actually was several coaches where they hid behind a, a fallacy of success which was our practice can't be that bad because look at these players that have arrived in the first team environment and in one case actually into a national team. Um, so, so it can't have been that bad for them. Well, may, maybe not. You know, maybe they'd be even more successful. But more importantly, what about all those people that have gone by the wayside um, you know, outside of that, that environment and, and are trying to make it in a life that, wasn't what they envisaged and probably wasn't what they were told throughout their their uh career yeah jason thank you so much for your time and and everything that you've uh you've offered to us today um where do people find you if they want to reach out 
Uh, they can email me as long as they're not abusive. Uh, Jason McCoy, <laughs> spell M C K O I at mercurialsports.com. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter at mercurialsports.com, at mercurialsports even, or visit the website www.mercurialsports.com. Uh, or reach out to me on LinkedIn, which I think is a very useful way of connecting with people like minded. I think it's how me and you connected. So, um, yeah, um, yeah. Or Instagram at Mercurial Sports, um, but I'm open to, to to collaborations and speaking to people about all sorts. So uh, feel free to reach out. I think in this environment that we're in, that's that's something that we're, we're all having to do a lot more yeah. of, and hopefully there'll be some really positive things that come from. As you say, you know, we we connected over LinkedIn, and uh, yeah. it's fantastic to have these conversations with you. Uh, I do have one last question: uh, If you were able to have an audience with just one person. And you got to choose who that was. Who are you going for? Living or dead? Either. Okay. Um, well, my I'm a hero icon is Malcolm X. So it would probably be him. Um, I just yeah, probably him. If I could sit down and have a chat with him and find out what his thoughts, especially in the world where the world is now. I mean, when he left it, it was a pretty messed up place. But, you know, 2020 being what it's been and, and every, everything that's going on with in America and other parts of the world, it'd be interesting to sit down and, and get his thoughts on, on, on the situation. Um, from a sporting context, I know you didn't ask me this, but I'm trying to keep it in the sporting frame. Um, that's a tough one. Pep, Pep Guardiola. Yeah. Oh, and that's a purely that's from a purely football coaching point of view I think the guy's a genius so um, yeah it would be him yeah, I'd love to be a fly on the wall with with, with both of those conversations uh, you just like everyone else uh, breaks the rules chooses more than one uh, you're not you're not alone in that everyone else has done the same uh, <laughs> so yeah, but it, again thanks for your time Jason it's really really been a, been a, a wonderful conversation and uh, I hope people will take the opportunity to reach out to you respectfully and um, we'll, we'll have a chance to, to connect with your, your vast knowledge over all this brilliant and it just leaves me to say welcome to the tribe thanks a lot Tim that's it for episode 9 with Jason McCoy his details are in the description should you wish to reach out and follow his work music you are listening to is by BB Phoenix. And once again, thank you for listening, engaging, and I look forward to having you back here next week.